November 9th, like most of you, I woke up expecting a different political outcome. And when I realized that the election had gone the way that it did, the Christian part of my brain said, like Job, that which I fear greatly has come upon me. But the Amy, Wine part, the Amy Winehouse part of my brain <laughs> went with an opening line from one of her songs, what kind of f***ery is this? <laughs> and then after the first 100 days of this administration, I had my answer, it was total f***ery. <laughs> right. Now, now, I know my mantra is that I'm a Christian and, you know, I was reared in the South, Eric, and you know my mama didn't raise me to talk like that. <laughs> but I would contend that if you're more concerned about the language that I use than you are about the policies coming out of the White House, then I suggest that you recalibrate your sensibilities. <laughs> because there's a difference between impolite language and obscenity. Obscenity is when you uh, kick people out of the country simply because they're brown and they speak a different language. <laughs> obscenity is when you want to take very much deserved and needed health care from people. <laughs> obscenity is when you want to control the lives of women by taking away their right to be self-determined about their bodies. So you need to check yourself if you're more concerned about cuss words than you are about pernicious political policies. You know, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about my background and my life. I'm going to leave Martha something to do during our interview. All right? But what I do want to do is uh, read from uh, my book, Life's Work, A Moral Argument for Choice. And I picked my favorite chapter in the book to read. Uh, because one, because it's short, and two, uh, because it, it, it pulls together a whole lot of things that I was trying to make sense of when I wrote this chapter. I was trying to make sense of the fact that someone would take the notion to say that uh, black women uh, are under assault killing their babies because of a conspiracy theory by saying that Planned Parenthood has hatched a plot to kill black women and black babies and to call it black genocide. What didn't make sense about that was that you would create policies that would force women to continue pregnancies and then deny them the very resources to raise those babies with a modicum of dignity. Yeah. And so when I did the math, things didn't add up. And so they say sometimes, uh, watch the birdie, you know, sometimes this hand over here is distracting you while this hand is doing something else. And so when it came down to what it was all about in terms of whose fertility was really at stake and who was really at risk for being controlled, I connected a few dots. And uh, I'm going to read that chapter, and I'm going to see if you can connect those dots. Somebody once said that you can't awaken somebody who's pretending to be asleep. So I'm going to read this chapter, and we're going to see if you're awake or if you're pretending to be asleep. The chapter is called Black Genocide and the White Majority. It's chapter nine. Nothing enrages me more than the anti's most recent strategic gambit, the Black Genocide Movement, launched in its current iteration in 2009 by white anti-abortion activists in Georgia. It is a craven and cynical effort to get black people to regard the clinical practice of abortion, as well as the whole abortion rights movement as an assault by white America on blacks. Banking on the fact that 37% of the women uh, who seek abortion in America are black, the black genocide movement positions Planned Parenthood as the main perpetrator of this genocide and the birth control pioneer Margaret Sanger as its chief architect. The black genocide movement is nothing but, nothing more than a conspiracy theory pretending that abortion is a white plot to kill black babies and that by raising this awareness in black communities, it's protecting millions of blacks, black lives from slaughter. As an African-American abortion provider who grew up in poverty, I take this accusation that I am complicit 
in this white plot very personally. It is true that because women and women, that poor women and women of color have less access to reliable birth control and health care, that they are more likely than privileged women to have unplanned pregnancies. They are also less likely to have taken comprehensive sex ed in school, and the conditions of their lives are chaotic and unstable, which can lead to complex, less than socially acceptable decision making. They probably have choose medication abortion less than privileged women, although good data here are hard to find, because they make their decisions about their abortions at a later gestational age. The black women walk into abortion clinics more often than privileged women, not necessarily because they don't want another child or want to have the first one, because many of them do, but because the circumstances of their lives are constraining and prohibitive. Women of all races and socioeconomic groups cite multiple reasons for seeking an abortion. Lack of financial resources, relationship instability, more children at home. But this, but this multiplicity of factors disproportionately afflict poor women and women of color. I see it all the time. The implication that in their effort to preserve their own sanity and resources and to save their own lives, that, that these women are murderers makes me want to lash out like Jesus overthrowing the tables in the temple. The black genocide movement is a trumped up play to gain political advantage. Cynically disguised as civil rights, it targets the most vulnerable women and pits their pregnancy against their own self-interest. In doing so, the black genocide movement only serves to compound the misery of people who are already living in circumstances of pain and deprivation. I first saw the black genocide billboards on highways running through mainly African-American neighborhoods in Atlanta and New York. One of them had a gigantic photograph of a beautiful African-American child. It said, black children are an endangered species. Another said, the most dangerous place for our black babies in the womb. A third had a picture of President Barack Obama and read, every 21 minutes, our next possible leader is aborted. These signs prey on black women's traditional sense of responsibility to their community and imply that they have some kind of other duty higher than to themselves to continue a pregnancy. In 2009, a white pro-life filmmaker named Mark Crutcher produced a documentary-style propaganda piece called Ma'afa 21, which equates abortion by black women to slavery and the eugenics of experiments of the first half of the 20th century. Positioned as a civil rights film, it circulated widely amongst various African-American groups. After it came out, I read an interview with a young, well-educated student at Morris Brown College who said that having seen the movie, she now understood that there was a conspiracy to kill black people, implying that she'd factored that line of reasoning into her decision-making process should she ever find herself contemplating an abortion. This young woman was on track to realize her hopes and dreams, and it anguished me deeply that based on these lies, she was willing to go off track and to risk poverty for herself as well as for a prospective child which was precisely what the white purveyors of these lies hoped that she would do. Now when I see a patient like this in one of the clinics where I work, and I sense that she's wavering based not on her own inner voice, but because of some propaganda she's encountered somewhere, I try to rebuild her self-esteem and her dignity. I tell her that her decision to care for herself is not in conflict with any duty she may or may not have to other people who look like her, and that the shame that she feels is a product of outside forces who want her to feel this way. Not because, pe not because people care about her, but because as a poor woman or a woman of color, she's an easy target. She can be made into an example to further someone else's agenda. I remind her that before she can ever help anyone else, she must first help herself. I seldom see women who genuinely want to change their minds based on this propaganda. Most are resolute. They are committed to their course of action, but they are distressed by the social pressures they feel from such forces as the black genocide movement. I encourage these women to act on their own behalf and to feel the power of their own agency. The truth, I'm convinced, is that the people behind the black genocide movement, like Priests for Life and Like Dynamics, do not care about black babies or black women. 
they are often the same people who want to do away with public housing and who won't support state-sponsored child care. Theirs is a feigned concern. They are using women of color as pawns in a much bigger game. For they, are, for they understand what too few of the foot soldiers in the abortion debate do, debate do. In abortion politics, all women are sisters linked by their ability to bear children. If the antis can change the terms of the abortion debate, framing it, framing it as a systemic racism perpetrated by big healthcare institutions against black people, then they can change the laws around abortion and no one will intervene, not even the white women who need abortions too. Their goal, and I'm preaching now and I can't help it, <laughs> is not actually to curtail abortion services for poor women and women of color. It is to limit access to abortion for all women, including and especially white women. Because the thing all too many white anti-abortion activists really want, which they can't say out loud, is for white women to have more babies in order to push back against the browning of America. <clears throat> As we march toward the reality that by 2050, no one racial or ethnic group will hold a proportional majority in this country, racial suicide paranoia abounds. And for the white racist legislators in red states, Nothing is more threatening than a majority brown country. It strips them of their historic power. The prospect of being outnumbered is what enabled the Tea Party's mutiny of Congress in 2010 after the election of Barack Obama, America's first black president, allowing them to cripple the Republican establishment. It rendered the first major party female presidential candidate powerless, and it enabled the rise of the racist, nationalistic, and misogynistic Donald Trump. Yes, I said it. <laughs> the white people who are still in charge believe that if their women don't start having a lots of babies, they, the white patriarchs, are going to become obsolete. A hundred years ago, a white politician with this same fear who, who, who hoped to exert control over female fertility would have just said so. In his 1905 speech on American motherhood, Theodore Roosevelt encouraged white women to do their duty and to have at least two, ch two children or else contemplate race suicide. In these times, such bald articulation of racist values is impossible, or at least it used to be. Too many of their own women are working and going to school and running businesses and running for political office and taking birth control pills. Hence. Any outward pressure on daughters or sisters or wives to have more children would be risible. And so, the white men in charge have invented a workaround. They've tied their antipathy towards abortion together with civil rights and the Black Lives Matter movement. They understand that by curtailing abortion for black women, they curtail it for white women too. It's a sleight of hand, a misdirection. The way I see it, the attack on abortion rights is nothing less than an effort to put all women back in their place. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi, Seattle. Mic check, mic check, one, two, one, two. I think it's working. This is really, this is exciting for me on so many levels for so many reasons. Number one, I'm here getting to talk with Dr. Parker, whom I've met a few times. Um, and is, uh, of course, one of my heroes and, and one of my favorite people, and now one of my favorite writers, by the way, because uh, I've read your book. Believe it or not, I did, I did read it before we did this, and I encourage all of you to do the same, but also because I'm here in Seattle with you. Now, uh, Seattle has some uh, particular uh, significance for me for lots of reasons. Um, I have got a lot of family here, some of whom are here in the audience tonight, um, I also had my first abortion at the Seattle Planned Parenthood. Yay! Notice I said first. I said first, and I don't want Seattle, I don't want you guys to feel insecure. It was my best one. <laughs> uh, 
heads and tails above the rest. If I could Yelp review it, I totally would. And if that doctor's here tonight, uh, I don't remember you at all. I was 19. Um, I was 19, and uh, but I thank you nonetheless. Um, and if if uh, the doc, I mean, you won't, you probably won't remember because I wasn't that famous then. <laughs> um, it's a little warm in here, and also I'm a little pre uh, perimenopausal, so I'm going to take my jacket off. My shirt says feminist. Anyway, here we go, huh? Here we go. Let, so let's get cracking. Um, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm really thrilled that you chose to read that particular uh, passage or that chapter from your book. I was, I was planning on asking you about it, and I'd like to get into more detail about it later on, if we may. Uh, but I want to start with the most basic. Well, first of all, let me just drink some wine. I'm like... I'm like the undereducated Christopher Hitchens of abortion. <laughs> I require I require wine. Anywho, here we go. Let's just start with the basics. I want to start with the Hippocratic Oath. I was doing a little research, extra research for our conversation, and I learned. Uh, first of all, the, the, there's a lot of versions of the Hippocratic Oath. It's been around since the ancient Greeks, of course, and it's had many iterations. Um, but the most recent one uh, was adapted and, and written in 1964 by a guy incidentally named Louis Lasagna. <laughs> Would you like to make a cheesy joke about that? It's important to open with jokes, I find, Dr. Parker. But, but we, we commonly uh, think of the Hippocratic Oath as beginning with the phrase, first, do no harm. Um, technically, those words aren't really in there, but the, but the idea is. And I, I want you to sort of talk about how that concept uh, relates to your vocational relationship with your practice as a physician. How does your work as a physician, and particularly abortion services, uh, how, do you, how, do you, how does that concept enter into that? Well, uh, the, the, the Latin phrase is primum no no ser. Correct! First, first ding, ding, <laughs> ding! <laughs> and with regard to when, when women present to me for care as an OBGYN, or when pregnant people present to me, um, first do no harm is when you take into account that person's needs, uh, if you can't help them, don't harm them. Um, and so uh, first do no harm is, you know, affirmative is to help, but the, the, the negative restraint is don't do any harm. And so when it comes to a woman who has an unplanned, unwanted pregnancy and if you've chosen not to provide abortion, which the first 12 years I, that was my position uh, where I stood at the time, first do no harm is the secondary obligation you have to that person. So if I'm not gonna do any, an abortion, if I can't help, first do no harm would mean that I would not stand in her way and that I have an obligation to get her to the care that she needs. And so uh, when physicians say as a matter of conscience that they don't provide abortions, that's fine because you shouldn't do anything that you can't do conscientiously. But if you fail to refer that person on, you're now doing harm because you didn't help, but now you're, you're not getting her to the service that she needs. And so I felt in the first 12 years of my practice when I didn't provide abortions, even though I didn't provide them, I never stood in a woman's way. So I was always careful to refer patients. And so, I don't have a notion that, uh, I was on the radio uh, last, last week uh, uh, on 1A, the replacement for the Diane Rames show, and then the national uh, president of the American Association of Pro-Life OBGYNs mm -hmm. said that when she's taking care of a pregnant woman, she has two patients, and she always has to think about two of her patients. Mm. And so 
what that meant to me, the question that I formulated was, so tell me what part of the Hippocratic Oath that requires you to lobby a woman against her own interests. Mm -hmm. So when a woman tells you that she's pregnant and she doesn't want to be and she's asking for your help, why do you feel compelled to say, but what about the baby that you're carrying? Yeah. So first do no harm means that if I'm not going to help you, I'm not going to harm you, I'm not going to question your decision, and if I can't do care for you, I'm going to refer you to somebody else who can. Right. Uh, and so we'll, so let's talk about how you came to think about it because you've just said that in your early career uh, you didn't provide this particular type of care. Um, and but, but even though you write about it as though it, it wasn't, um, uh, it wasn't something you provided, you also didn't fully object. In a way, you kind of were able to sort of opt out. Um, and part of this is because you come from a very deeply religious background, but it's not a typically uh, religious background. And it struck me that reading your book, your curiosity was very much always a part of your, your, of your faith. And it's part of what brought you to your faith as a young man, because you, you weren't necessarily raised to be uh, sort of a, a doctrinaire or, you know, sort of following uh, by rote. But you came to your own faith very independently, very on your own as a young man. So tell us a little bit about your, your spiritual life as a young person, because it didn't seem to stifle your curiosity. It seemed to be part of your development as a curious person. So I grew up in Birmingham, uh, the belt buckle of the Bible belt, in my opinion. And uh, what that means, I had a very traditional religious understanding. Grew up in the church, the Black Baptist Church, and growing up in the early '70s, '80s, uh, when I came to my own religious conversion experience, it predated the whole pro-life, pro-choice narrative, mm -hmm. which didn't really take off until the mid to late '80s with the moral majority. And anchoring my spirituality in that period. Uh, can help one understand why I was never taught explicitly that, was, that abortion was wrong. Mm -hmm. But what I did observe is that there were uh, gender inequalities in how sexuality was dealt with because the young women in my church, if they became pregnant, they were, uh, and they were participating in church life, they were, when it, when it became obvious that they were pregnant, they were sat down out of activities and then they were required to give birth and then come back and apologize to the church to be restored in their relationship. But I never saw a young man who had impregnated a woman be sat down and have to do the same, right? So even though I didn't have a framework of feminism or anything, I just knew there was something wrong about young boys and young girls being treated differently with regard to sexuality. So. Fast forward, I didn't really think about uh, abortion. I'm sure people in my community had them, but I didn't have to think about it because as someone who wasn't sexually active, being observant to my Christian understanding, so I wasn't at risk for impregnating anybody or becoming pregnant, I didn't really have to think about an unplanned pregnancy until I became a physician and then saw women who needed this care. Um, Growing up and not having to think about it and then going through a residency program where I didn't get any training, I was always able to beg off or sign off. I couldn't do what I didn't know how to do, but I also lived in communities where nobody provided the care and so we would always refer. So when I saw women and they asked for my help, I dutifully referred them, but increasingly I became uncomfortable referring women on when I knew what they faced when abortion wasn't available. Right. And when, so, so leading on to your early career as an OBGYN, which progressed apace, and you were obviously uh, a brilliant student, and you moved very quickly uh, into your career. Um, and as you say, you began not really viewing abortion necessarily as evil, but it didn't really, it was sort of like a necessary evil, let's say. Is that fair to say? I think that was fair in terms of I was, I was morally conflicted about what it meant for me to provide them. I never questioned a woman's uh, right. Whether or not it was actually right. something that was needed right. in medicine in general. And even that was an uncritical thinking approach to my Christian understanding. It was a mm -hmm. default position. Right. Nobody had ever said, you know, I never had anybody say abortion was murder until much later. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but even that didn't sit well with me. But again, I never thought it through right. until I became a, a women's health provider. And so, at the time of your residency at the University of Cincinnati, uh, abortion care was not offered to patients at the University of Cincinnati. Is that correct? Um, no, did, did I? They, you're correct. Right, they right. would have to go to Planned Parenthood. So That's I, right. They would. You right. would have to refer. Right. Right. Um, but sometime at some at a point during your time at your, your during your residency, you did inv eventually get to uh, see an, uh, an abortion. I, I believe it was a second term, a second trimester abortion. Um, and it was performed by a, a female doctor, Correct. I believe. Right. And you were, you were exposed the first time to the actual experience of seeing the procedure performed and all of this. And, and you slowly, in other words, what I'm trying to talk about here is that your natural curiosity, your intellectual and scientific curiosity has mm -hmm. been a, an essential part of your development, not just spiritually, but as a doctor as well. Right. Uh, throughout your life. So this isn't so much a story of the revelation of a religious man who suddenly came, woke up. Right. This, is the, this book is very much a story of a journey of, an, of uh, the development of a human person, right. which I think is important to, to say. Right. Because it, it's far too easy to think of these things in terms of like, for lack of a better term, come to Jesus moments. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? That's fair. I, uh, you know, to your point, um, I was always intellectually curious, mm -hmm. a scientist, and was deeply committed and serious about my spirituality and my faith understanding. Yeah. Uh, and prior to, they, the, the two never had to meet because as a college student and a biology student, there was nothing about reproduction. I understood where babies came from but there was nothing where I had a direct responsibility for managing reproduction in someone. Mm -hmm. And so in my Christian understanding, you know, the miracle of life and all of that, um, as science began to demythologize reproduction for me, uh, it didn't demystify it. So in my spirituality, I still held the mystery and the wonder of life, but as a traditional thinking Christian, the default, because people began to say abortion is murder, and I hadn't reconciled those, mm -hmm. when I had to then think about what traditional Christianity said about abortion, and then what my responsibilities were, I had to figure out a way, to your point, to reconcile. So it was a journey. It wasn't the dramatic narrative, I was an anti-abortion person, then I flipped. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's sexier, but that wasn't my story. And yet, yeah. and yet, there were things that happened along the way that right. sort of tipped the needle, right? right. right. So, and, and that brings us to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So there you are in Hawaii after this, you know, after your residency, you, you are invited to Hawaii um, by a colleague of yours, who, and you're there, um, uh, you're very successful, and you're working at the University of Hawaii, um, at a faculty appointment there, and, and you're living in this gorgeous condo, and you describe I still it. own it. <laughs> Smart man. Smart man. Real estate, baby. I'm telling you, it's the key. So anyway, um, so there you are in Hawaii, um, and, uh, you know, you, you write actually in very gorgeous prose about, you know, the experience of living there, having grown up in a as you call it, a tin-roofed house in Birmingham. And you had this faculty appointment, and then you're, you're also, at the same time, while you're living this, you know, in this gorgeous place, you're also doing, continuing to do work by giving service at, a, at a, a, an outpatient clinic. And it's at that outpatient clinic, I believe, that uh, you meet somebody with, uh, who, or you have an experience with a doctor, Dr. Sweet, who's it's a pseudonym, of course, you're very respectful in not revealing this person, but an experience you have in observing this doctor's behavior kind of flips a switch. Can you describe what happened there? So uh, Dr. Sweet became the clinic administrator. This is around 2002. Uh, uh, president W. Bush is president there, you know, we're, they're working on the partial birth abortion ban. Mm -hmm. They've imposed the international gag order. They're contemplating a domestic gag order. And uh, he sees as an administrator, as a fundamentalist Christian with who embraced the notion that abortion is murder. I think he was a very sincere person, but he saw, he took the initiative to 
asked the administrator to push abortion services out of the care. And uh, his reasoning was- It had it, been part of the care there. It had been part of the care since 1970, since, because Hawaii was one of the first states to right. legalize abortion. And he, uh, so for about 30 years, this has, had been a non-issue, mm -hmm. no matter who had been the president. And he decided that uh, he thought that the clinic funding was at, uh, at risk, or at least that was his rationale, but at any rate, he used his prerogative to stop us from providing abortion care for women. Now, mind you, I didn't provide the care, but we had the capacity there, my colleagues did, mm -hmm. and I was directly responsible for those women. So this was the first time where I was working in a situation where the capacity to provide the care was there. I was responsible for at least steering patients towards that care, and that was being taken away. Right. So now I had a direct challenge around what my response was gonna be, both as a person of uh, integrity, as a Christian, as a person committed to social justice. What do you do when you're witnessing injustice? Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the context in which I had to contemplate as a woman's health provider, what am I gonna do about this care that I know is critical for women? Mm -hmm. And that was, it was on that day when I was told that we didn't have any other recourse but to honor his wishes that I was on, en route home and I uh, listened to the sermon by Dr. King. Quite extraordinary because you also describe a lifelong uh, sort of relationship with the sermons and lessons of Dr. King, um, which of course should come as no surprise to anyone who has a, you know, a, a sort of relationship with the ideas of social justice and and particularly a spiritual relationship to social justice. But um, that's the beginning of your sort of connecting the two, um, which I think is really interesting because um, many of us, and I think particularly white uh, people, I can only speak for myself, but I'm, I happen to be uh, extremely white. I don't know if you noticed. Um, but white people tend to think of Dr. King as this sort of catch-all, sort of, you know, justifier, right? But it's a very different thing for you. Can you talk a little bit about that? So, Dr. King, uh, who I have a great deal of reverence for, and as I looked at his life, I saw striking parallels. Dr. King had aspirations to become a physician mm -hmm. uh, and ended up as a, as a minister from a legacy of, of having grandparents and parents as ministers. I, my, in my early Christian experience, I spent time as a lay minister and was a boy preacher, but ended up as a physician. Mm -hmm. Both of us had to reconcile the notion of science and religion. Mm -hmm. And so as I was in, in my crisis moment around, okay, so I have a spiritual religious understanding there's a religious understanding of reproduction and the significance thereof. And then I'm a scientist and a clinician and I understand the biology of reproduction. And so, as I said, as science demythologizes and takes away that whole, oh, babies just come with a stork and, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing, um, religion still has this notion of non-scientific understanding. And so Dr. King made a statement that really broke down that false barrier and allowed me to integrate my spiritual identity and my chosen craft and my intellect as a scientist where he says that science gives mankind knowledge which is power, religion gives mankind wisdom which is control, mm. the two are not enemies. And so what I took that to mean was that science answers very important questions and religion answers very important questions. Mm. They, don't, they answer different types of questions but their answers are not interchangeable. You can't answer religious questions with scientific answers or scientific answer questions with religious answers. For example, if I were in Sunday school and I asked my Sunday school teacher, where were the dinosaurs on the ark? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right? right? Yeah. That's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> right? Right. When you're trying to, uh, if you don't, in the right way combine a scientific and a religious understanding. The essence of my book is captured in a meme that I, that I saw. Uh, <laughs> where Leave it to memes. Yeah. And so there's this man who's talking to this woman and he's, I think he's 
he's supposed to be Adam, the first man, and he's talking to this woman, and you, he apparently has made reference to this woman that you came from my rib. Mm -hmm. And she says to him, I didn't come from your rib, you came from my vagina. <laughs> right? 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 And so there is a scientific understanding of, of, of reproduction and a religious understanding of reproduction every right there. Every time he says vagina, drink. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so for me, the real tension, there's, there's a false tension mm. there, you know. And, and so what I had to do was reconcile my, my chosen craft and my calling to social justice and compassion and humanity. And for me, humane, compassionate response to the needs of women forced me to finally conclude that I was never going to be more of a Christian than I was a human being. Right. Right? right. I'm never going to be more black than I am human. I'm never going to be more heterosexual than I am human. And if any of those identities compete with my humanity, I reject them outright. Mm -hmm. Is that me? I think, I, oh, it's because I was aiming my mic at you. So, so um, you've just given me permission to get really super deep into religion. Um, and, you know, because your book is, well, one could see it many ways until one reads it. And you make your own decision, uh, I imagine, for yourself. And I imagine you, you would encourage that. Um, but it's, it's not, um, it's much more than sort of, you know, a, a religious justification or religious, it's much more than a polemic. It's a very common refrain, as you know, um, among antis, and you refer to them repeatedly in the book. I mean, it's clearly an editorial choice as antis. Right, and we'll, I, I'll ask you about that as well. Um, um, to, to sort of uh, uh, force this idea that if women just understood better, right, if they just could be convinced that life is good and that life is better, and that the life they're carrying is more important than them, if they could just be convinced, then this whole problem would be solved. Um, they'd reject the choice, in other words, to, to uh, terminate their, their uh, pregnancy. And obviously it's problematic on a bajillion levels. But I, I'd like you to speak a little bit about the persistence of this particular type of prejudice uh, within the, uh, well, particularly among Christians in this country. If you could talk about the persistence of this idea that women are fundamentally incapable of understanding what they're doing. Yeah, well, right, right. Well, there's the notion that, um uh, women are incapable of handling the complexity of the decision-making about whether or not to become a mother, uh, that a woman who rejects the primacy of motherhood in her life has to be mentally unstable, that she has to be uh, resistant to the natural order of things, uh, facilitates uh, the patriarchal uh, justification for denying women uh, the right to make decisions about a biologic process going on in their bodies. And so I start with the notion that uh, 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 men and women are both human beings and human agency uh, belongs to each person. And so any religious justification or understanding uh, that does not hold men and women morally equal and morally a able to make decisions for their lives is not one that I can abide by. And so uh, I, um, uh, have to, I, 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 I think about this issue the way uh, 
uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, when he was asked why he freed the slaves, we know the Civil War is fought for multiple reasons. But the reason that he Pretty gave, much the main one with uh, we got to really right. just admit it. Right. But the... But the what the what what he said was, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master, which is to say, as a man, I will not participate in a patriarchal system that says that women are not capable of making decisions about their lives. I will not participate. I will not comply with a system that will uh, dethrone a woman in her life and make her less important than the pregnancy that she's carrying. And so. Um, the religious understanding that a woman was created to be a helpmate to a man, that women come from men, that the man is the head of the house, in various ways in which women are forced into a subordinate role uh, doesn't square with any understanding of God that I have or that I would embrace. Um, Besides, I believe the joke that said that when God created man, she was only kidding. <laughs> and I make that joke only because, you know, it, that joke used to upset me with a patriarchal understanding. But if we can fancy that God is uh, male, either God is male and female or God is neither, right? And so part of the problem has been we've always seen the image of God in the masculine, but we never see it in the feminine. So God has become a widow because we've killed the goddess. Well, I mean, that you know, well, well stated. I mean, look, uh, you know, as, a, as an atheist, I would he sit here and say, well, you know, this is the trouble with religion, right? Because it's subjective all the way. Right. It's impossible uh, for me to sit here as an atheist and say to you, well, you know, God is this, God is a fantasy. What are we going? But all of life is subjective, right? Whether eh. Well, but it, yeah. it's subjective in that something like as personal as religion or, 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 or refusal of religion mm -hmm. is, you know, it's like the difference between criminal law and civil law, right? The evidentiary standards are different, right? Yes. With criminal law, it's beyond a shadow of a doubt. With with civil law, it's, it's uh, well, like you know, it's like let's just be reasonable. Yeah. Right. So, my thing is, something as personal as religion has to, should be in the private space. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to how we make decisions about how we live in community, we have to rely on things that are more objective, like science and evidence. Uh, yes. <laughs> you mentioned in your book that, and I'm going to quote you here, um, uh, 11, well, this is a fact, 11... Uh, people since uh, Roe v. Wade was decided have been assassinated for this work, um, including four doctors. Uh, and you say, uh, when your family uh, approaches or c expresses concern for your safety, you say, um, I'm going to just draw from your book here, the truth is that I am more afraid of living a life of cowardice, of allowing anxiety over prospective harm to keep me from my convictions. I can live with the awareness that someone might harm me. I am not so sure that I am brave enough to live with the awareness that I was too afraid to do what I knew to be right. Now, it could be argued that this conviction that, that you hold for doing, quote unquote, what is right, is in a sort of parallel way held by the very assassins that you reference, as well as the picketers that you encounter each day, and some of whom we saw out here. Um, uh, and, and, you know, those people, whatever, but, but some of them are quite dangerous. How are you able, or, or how do you address that those religious convictions on the part of those assassins and those people who would violate and, uh, you know, suppress the rights of others, how do you uh, differentiate between their convictions, which are deeply felt and deep, you know, very real, between what you know to be the moral conviction that you hold that you must do what you must do? Well, uh 
my, um, the difference between what they feel is they feel driven. They're clear about what they will kill for. I'm clear about what I live for. Thank you. Right. 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 Uh, given the inevitability of death, it doesn't make sense to me to be preoccupied with the fact that it's coming. Mm -hmm. um, I, like, I think Dr. King said it best, you know, at the risk of being trite, but I find a lot, I mind the things that he thought and said a lot for my perspective on how I'm choosing to live my life. He said that, you know, longevity has its place. He was 39 when he died, but when he died, he had uh, four children and a wife. You know, I don't have anybody looking to me beyond the future. But he says, you know, like anybody else, I want to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But if a person hasn't found something that they live for so deeply and fully that uh, they're willing, to, they live for it, and if somebody's hostile enough that they might take your life over, he said, you're really not fit to live. He said, you could live... If, if that happens to you at the age of 35, you can live another 65 years. He says, but when you, when you finally start breathing at 100, uh, the, the death of spirit that happened at the age of 35, when you start breathing at 100, it's a belated announcement of something that's already happened to you. So rather than being the walking dead, you know, I'm choosing, to, I'm choosing what I live for. Somebody might try and hurt me. I don't have any control over that. But I'm going to walk forward. I'm... Uh, uh, I, the other thing I do is I put it into perspective. The risk that somebody might kill me for providing abortion is smaller than the risk that women take by being pregnant when they don't want to be. Maternal mortality is not zero, and it's on the rise in this country. So yes, it is. In fact, we have the risk, only rising maternal mortality uh, uh, rates in the developed world. Isn't that right. correct? That's correct. So, you know, it's all a matter of perspective and not being oblivious to the risk, but right-sizing the risk. Uh, it's important enough to me, as I said, when uh, I made the decision to help women I'm less concerned about what happens to me for trying to help. I'm more concerned about what happens to women if no one tries to help them. And uh, so um, that's my trajectory. I don't, I don't worry about the critics. I don't worry about the, the people who are angry. I focus on the women. And if women can muster the courage to overcome all the hurdles and the barriers that we're putting in their way, I just want to make sure that there's somebody there to meet them. Thank you very much. If antis say that abortion equals murder, uh, how can you uh, convince them otherwise if you have? Or how did you do it? Well, first of all, I'm not convinced that you can, I don't hold the idea that the notion, the opinion that you can convince anybody of anything. You can create opportunities for people to, to think, but you can't convince them of anything. The, the, the mind is like a parachute. It, it only works when it's open. And if doors are closed, the, more, the harder you press on doors that are closed, the more firmly they're closed. So I just abide by the notion that truth matters, and I speak the truth. Uh, and, um, or, and give the facts, uh, not alternative facts. So uh, when, when they say life, like they say abortion is murder, I understand what you're trying to say, but murder is a legal definition. In order to murder somebody, they have to be a person. A fetus is not a person. I know you want it to be. I know you've tried to pass laws to that effect, but there's no, there's no law in this country that recognizes the fetal the fetus as a person. Personhood is conferred at birth. And if you really believe that abortion is murder, call 911 and see if the police will come to an abortion clinic. But hang on a second, though. Because this is actually important. There are, there are 29 states at this moment that recognize um, 
the rights of the fetus when it comes to fetal endangerment laws. In that regard, I think this is very important because they do actually end up superseding the rights of the women. Um, they, were, they were mostly passed under the aegis of protecting women from abuse by, you know, abusive partners or whatever. Um, but more often than not, in fact, the majority of these laws, these fetal endangerment laws, are used to prosecute women, pregnant women. Um, so in a way, there, there, is, there are laws on the books that say that the fetus supersedes the female. But they're in the, they're in the criminal statute, and they're not under the health statute. You got me. Yeah. You got me. Yeah. So... Um, me and my gotcha they, questions. They become indirect, they're in, to your point, they're indirect personhood laws, yeah. but they still reside in the criminal standard statute to upgrade criminal charges related right. to behavior versus prosecuting women for pregnancy mm -hmm. as of yet, but we're on our way to that. As of yet, exactly. Well said. I can't believe I tried to gotcha Dr. Parker. <laughs> What's the matter with me? So here's another really good one from the audience. Why do you think late-term abortions, and late, it's interestingly in quotes here, late-term abortions are able to galvanize so much anti-choice action when the facts are that these are an incredibly small percentage of abortions and often um, elected, well, elected, uh, only when women are in severe medical, uh, the, when a severe medical diagnosis is involved. I think uh, one late as a term as as uh, late is is late is one day beyond where you want it to happen. So for yeah, guys, <laughs> late is six weeks. You know. Uh, yeah. But what they're often saying, they even uh, then candidate uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, both of them were notoriously off base because they create the impression that you can, one day before your due date, you could have an abortion. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what, uh, what, why they focus on this is that at that point, the pregnancy looks so much like a baby mm. that it's easy for them to use that language that is to blur the lines and say, at that point, it's a baby. It's almost a baby. The reality is the pregnancy has as much capacity or at least the potential for life when conception occurs as it does when at the, at the birth. But what it means is stages of development matter. Mm -hmm. And so they try and misrepresent, they take a pregnancy at later in its development. It's not fully functional because if it were, you wouldn't be able to have an abortion. The late ter later term, the later pregnancies are pregnancies that are lethally flawed. Mm -hmm. Uh, instead of having four chambers to the heart, there's two. Instead of having a brain, there's no brain. Right. Um, instead of having kidneys, there are no lungs because there's no fluid. Mm -hmm. And so these pregnancies are able to be uh, sensationalized mm -hmm. because they are emotionally moving. Well, don't you also think, though, that, there, that it's a really easy way to characterize the whole concept of abortion as Absolutely. bad? Absolutely. Right? Because if you can have one at that stage, that must mean that it's always bad. Right. Does okay. that make sense? It, it, that makes sense. But the reality is abortions aren't bad. Okay. They aren't good. They're health care. That's right. But I think the, the, the question is really, is really interesting and it's worth asking because it's true that much of this legislation is based on this phony uh, reasoning. That, well, it's, reasoning isn't even a good word to use, but it, it's based on this phony propaganda or this phony focus on this, i.e., if women only knew they were killing a baby, right? Right? Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in there. Well, it's true, and, 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 I, and I'm not being flippant when they stand out and say, um, you're a baby killer. Mm -hmm. I've never killed a baby. I've ended pregnancies, but I've never killed a baby. That's right. 
And also, it, it completely rejects the reality of medicine as a thing, ge just generally. How has the terrain... <laughs> Uh, how is the terrain slash anti-abortion attacks on the pink house, as well as abortion clinics throughout the U.S., changed uh, since the Trump-Pence uh, regime took to power? It's, it's actually written here, fascist regime took to power. Uh, it's gone on steroids. Mm. Uh, the, uh, the validation from the highest office in the land of misogyny of racism, of vigilante action, of uh, legitimizing uh, uh, gun carriage mm -hmm. has meant that all these things that facilitate and empower people who are extremist and non-democratic in their descent mm -hmm. is everybody's right to agree or disagree with abortion, but what the, uh, ter the domestic terrorism and the refusal to call it that, mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, you can hang nooses in places that to intimidate when we know what they represent. Mm -hmm. uh, all of that represents the, uh, the sense or, of permissiveness that comes from the highest office in the land. And so we're seeing increases in attacks on uh, clinics, property damage, uh, sabotage. And it's not harassment. reported necessarily all the time. Well, it's monitored by organizations like the National Abortion Federation, but in terms of uh, being reported to law enforcement, they take a report, but you know. And, but it doesn't get in the press. Right, as well as we also, the person who's most responsible for enforcing the laws around protecting abortion facilities and oh my God, don't tell me it's Jeff Sessions. Jeff Sessions. Holy hell. And um, he. Oh, I heard he wants to quit. <laughs> Dr. Willie Parker, thank you so much. I so appreciate it. Thank you. Martha Plimpton and Willie Parker, everybody.